sometimes in the spiritual life we fall prey to the feelings and even the sin of envy when we think of another spiritual good as being evil because we think that it lessens our own excellence. We see in another some virtue or gift that we do not possess. And so rather than rejoice over that goodness, we grieve about it. It's against our will that they seem to have a greater holiness than we do, and so that gives rise to sorrow. Envy is wrong for two reasons. First, because the envious person is sad that the Holy Spirit gives grace to another soul and enriches that soul with spiritual gifts. Whenever the Spirit works, we should rejoice, not be sad. Second, because the envious person wastes time in comparing himself to others, when he should instead focus on cultivating the graces that God has given him. Today's Feast of All Saints teaches us to put aside envy and to love the other's spiritual good as well as our own, for every instance of grace and virtue gives praise to Christ and shows forth his beauty. In one of his works, St. Ambrose writes that Christ commended his beauty to his spouse under many figures. Ambrose was referring here to scripture, especially the Song of Songs, but his words can also be applied to the saints. The goodness and beauty of our Savior is too great to imitate. Even the Mother of God, full of grace, does not possess these things in the way that God incarnate does. Because of the hypostatic union and his being head of the church, Jesus' grace and virtue is far beyond any human being. He has the perfect temperament, perfect poise. Every word and action is precisely what is called for at that moment. Even if we are gazing on the humanity of Christ only, we should be overwhelmed. In order to manifest his goodness and beauty to the world and give us the hope of holiness, Jesus chooses to enrich his faithful ones, for we can look upon the face of a saint and live. We can gaze on the beauty of their souls and be drawn towards the limitless beauty of Christ. We know that in order to be a saint, that person must possess all the theological and moral virtues and excellence. He must be prudent, just, courageous, and temperate, and those virtues must be guided to their perfection by faith, hope, and charity. But at the same time, each saint shows forth a particular virtue or gift or beatitude. He cannot do all, for he is but one man. He is but one member of the body of Christ, whose role is complementary to the other members. He has a certain type of beauty, which images the one who is wholly beautiful, God. For instance, St. Peter is known for his courage, whereas St. John is known for his purity. St. Peter was chaste, and St. John was courageous, but the Lord willed that one virtue would be more brilliant than another in each of them. We find this also in regard to the theological virtues. St. Therese is known for her love of God, and St. Thomas Aquinas for his faith and knowledge, but both believed and loved heroically. St. Benedict enriched the Church by vowing stability and being the father of many monks in one place, while St. Francis Xavier went to foreign lands and moved about constantly to save souls. And then there are virtues of each sex and each age. The feminine genius of Catherine of Siena or John of Mola has its own beauty alongside the men and children saints of their own day. By learning about and coming to love the saints, we know more and more the truth of our Savior. Christ commended his beauty to his spouse under many figures. By loving the beauty of each figure, each saint, we love Christ who lives in them. And we come to see that each has its own beauty, which is distinct and unique, and we rejoice in that, as we rejoice in diverse colors in nature, or many volumes in the library. We are glad in what stands out in their character. We do not lament what lies hidden, for it is the Lord who chooses to make them shine in this way, just as he makes another shine in another way. As St. Paul says in Corinthians, there is one glory of the sun and another of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. There is one glory of Christ, another of his mother, and another for each saint. 
But this joy that we have in the saints should also teach us to have joy in one another and in ourselves. We must each strive to possess all the virtues, that is true. We cannot foster justice but neglect chastity or focus so much on prudence that we are not courageous. And we must allow the moral virtues to be elevated by the theological ones, otherwise they lack their proper goal and power. But beyond these common necessities, we should rejoice in the spiritual goodness and beauty of our neighbors. We should also thank God for our own graces and gifts. So for instance, I do not break my sleep every night, but their carlutions do, and I am glad that they keep vigil for the church. I do not preach to the nations, but just to little Charlestown, but the faithful missionaries do, and I rejoice at that very much. I'm not a biological parent, and so I don't know your sacrifices and trials, but I do admire them. And because such persons belong to Christ and the church, they belong to me too. Their virtues and their gifts are mine also. Therefore, I also have a duty to develop my own gifts, such that others will know me and love Christ more profoundly because of me. He makes each one of us beautiful by his grace, but we must allow him to do so. He gives us reason to rejoice always, but we still must do the rejoicing. And so on this blessed feast, let us be joyful. Let us be glad of the beauty that God has given us in his saints, both those in heaven, those here in the church with us, and those who have crossed our paths. Such gratitude and joy makes us worthy to look one day upon the face of beauty itself. May that always be our sincere desire and